we're, we're almost to the schedule release. That'll be the next pod, but we have a lot to get to today. Yeah, and that's going to be a fun one. I mean, that's always like one of the more fun days of the year. We got a couple of days for that, and uh, yeah, kind of. It's kind of like the the first day you can really kind of think it's next year now because next year's starting to take shape with the roster. Now you have the schedule. It just doesn't feel like last year anymore. So, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. But like I mentioned, this is uh, we have a lot to get to today. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Uh, Tom Brady has his next job lined up after this one. We want to talk about that a little bit and try to pick some current Eagles we think will be good in the broadcast booth. We want to go through the entire rookie draft class and figure out what they, uh, how much they might play, what their roles might be in the upcoming season. And we know at least one game on the Eagles schedule, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But something kind of topical, Rube, we wanted to, to mention off the bat here. A very notable cornerback has hit the free agency market, James Bradbury. The Giants released him. They tried to trade him for a while, weren't able to get a trade uh, completed. So now he's a free agent. The Eagles have a pretty noticeable hole at their second cornerback position. So on its face, this makes a lot of sense. Is, Is this a direction you think the Eagles should go? No question about it, Dave. I mean, you have a guy who's in his prime, um, he's, you know, he's two years removed from a pro bowl. Uh, he's a playmaker and, you know, he had an unwieldy contract. I don't think anyone was surprised the giants weren't able to trade him. Uh, he was due a ton of money in, in tw- the next two years. And, you know, it's just, it's just tough to trade that kind of contract and, and people know he's going to be free agent. Now, maybe there's a little bidding and his price, you know, isn't, isn't reasonable. And if that's the case, you know, what we've seen from Howie this offseason is that he'll be involved in free agents, but when the price is, you know, outlandish, when it gets into Christian Kirk territory, he, he's just going to drop out. He's going to be smart about it. Uh, he's going to pick and choose, and I think that's the case with, with Bradbury. He's a good player, and I'll tell you what, if you have Slay and Bradbury at cornerback, you know, all of a sudden, that's a strength of the team. I mean, Bradbury, is a, he's a one. I mean, he's hes capable of being a one. He would be two here. Uh, but, you know, it would it would give you um, a lot of flexibility if, if – you know, it, uh, um, it would give uh, Gannon a lot of flexibility as far as, where, you know, how they play, who they line up against. Uh, it's, it's kind of an intriguing deal. You know they have to be interested. I mean, I can't think of any. He played really well last year. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense. It's just going to come down like everything else to the price. And, you know, you can get them for something reasonable. And for a guy with his ability, I, I think the starting point is probably $10 million a year you know, for, for uh, a Pro Bowl caliber corner starting quarterback. Uh, how he can make it work, he can make the numbers work, but it's just a matter of how much he wants to spend and how, how in demand James Bradbury is and how high his price goes. Yeah, I think you're overstating how good he was last year a little bit. I, I, he wasn't, you know, as good last year as we've seen him before. Uh, you know, I uh, he wasn't a Pro Bowl caliber player last year, but he still started he's almost better every than Ty year. Gowan and Kerry Vincent Jr. and Mac McCain. Okay, but there's a there could be a, a big gap between guys we've never seen play and a, a Pro Bowl corner. So, uh, you know, I and to be fair, we don't know how good those guys are. I'm not banking they'll be better than than James Bradbury, but that's the unknown the Eagles have right now at the cornerback position is, you know, they have a bunch of young, unproven guys, where at least James Bradbury is proven and he's played a lot in this league and he'd be a really solid starter. I I, I wouldn't expect him to come here and, and you know, all of a sudden be a pro bowler again. I, I don't know if that's realistic, but – He's still young enough that that's possible. And, you know, even if he is just a CB2 for a year before he moves on and gets a bigger contract, that would make a lot of sense for the Eagles. They, they, I don't think they should go into this season with what they have. Now, beyond James Bradbury on the free agency market, I don't know if it's worth signing one of those guys right now. You know, I, I have a list in front of me we can go through in a minute, but um, Bradbury is clearly the top available player. So, if you can get him now, you do it. Otherwise, there might be more of a case to be made for waiting 
and seeing what these guys look like in OTAs, what they look like in training camp before then trying to find that stopgap option. Yeah, that's fair. I, I mean, I I just find it hard to believe that, you know, one of those street guys is really going to pan out as a starting CB2. Now, it's possible. You know, maybe one of those guys, maybe Zach McPherson, um, you know, Mac McCain, Josiah Scott, maybe one of those guys, Mario Goodrich. Uh, I just don't think that's – I don't know if how sound a strategy is to just – get a bunch of guys who nobody else wanted and hope one of them can be. Now, look, maybe one of them will be a, a starting caliber guy, but I don't think the math really works works like that. I just think it's, you know, I mean, it, it, there's nothing to lose. None of these guys cost you anything, so uh, it can't hurt to let them all run around and, and, and try to sort it out at training camp. I just think it's a long shot that any of them will be a starting caliber guy. Uh, there's, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, it's it's certainly possible, but I mean Jalen Mills was a starting caliber guy for a couple of years as a seventh round pick, so it does happen. But it's not it's not doesn't happen often. So um, I think you really have a chance to upgrade. I mean they've upgraded uh, defensive line, they've upgraded linebacker, and it's a real chance to finally upgrade the secondary. What about how much it's going to cost? Because it James Bradbury will not be cheap. Even though, you know, it's it certainly hurt him that the major spenders of free agency have already gone. I mean, it's it. I think it does definitely hurt him that he's getting released in May and well past the first, second, and third waves of free agency. But there are still cornerback needy teams that will now have to bid on him and outbid the other to get him. You said $10 million which is a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money when you look at their Eagles are already paying Darius Slay a lot of money too. So are they going to be willing to sink that much of their allocation of cap space into one position like that? I, it's a fair question to ask. It is. And uh, I think that's, that's what you look at. I mean, t- you know, teams don't like to, Especially this team. I mean, they're they're the the D line and the O line are always going to be the highest paid positions on the team as long as Howie's here or Big Red or you know, even before that. It's just the way it's always been. That's the kind of the DNA of this franchise. Um, so that's that's a fair question, and I don't know the answer. I think that the way the NFL evolves more and more into a passing league every year, um, man, it's so important to have good corners and. You know, it's, uh, you look at the, the the quarterbacks this team faced last year. Now this year the QBs aren't. You know, you look at the lineup; it's not as imposing as last year. But uh, you know, they faced Brady and Mahomes. I mean, two of the best ever, back to back almost. So it's not like that. But still, um, teams love to throw the ball. There's good receivers in the in the division. Uh, not a lot of great quarterbacks in the division, but that could change any any year. Uh, I, I would certainly. Uh, if I could make the numbers work, I, I would do it. It's a matter of how much, how much you want to pay. I mean, if he wants fifteen million a year, there's no way. If you could do it for for ten million a year, I'm I'm interested. And at this point, so late in the process, it probably makes more sense for him to take a one year deal. And it's not it's we can call it a prove it deal. He's still going to get paid really well, right? Uh, but then it would give him a chance at twenty nine if he plays well here or somewhere else to then get a a multi year deal after that. That that seems to make the most sense to me. And I like James Bradbury as a player. It's just I'm looking at the numbers thinking, man, is it you're going to pay your two starting cornerbacks top-tier salaries? Is that the best allocation? And the salary cap you can figure out. I mean, uh, how he can add the dummy years, he can do the whole deal, and he can make it relatively inexpensive on the cap, which is what they would do if they sign a guy like Bradbury. Heck, they did it last year with guys that they didn't really even need to do it. Um, Where do you think it ends up? Because last year they got Steven Nelson even later in the process. And it was basically a one-year deal worth up to 4 million. He ended up making just under that um, with a significantly lower cap hit. So it's going to cost more than that. I I think that's definite. I I don't know how much more. Yeah. I mean, I I still think it's more, Unlikely than likely, you know how he's been. I mean, we all, everyone knew the Giants were. It was going to be a real long shot to trade him. 
Um, so everyone knew he was going to hit free agency at some point. So I'm sure those conversations have been made between um, Howie and the agent. So, um, I, yeah, I think I think he's going to end up being too expensive. I think it's you know, I don't think it's out of the question that he comes here, but I think it's a long shot at this point. Um, just because ha- Howie doesn't he just doesn't want to overspend. He just doesn't want to overspend at any position. And, uh, yeah, it is a lot of money. And, um, you know, I think we'll see, you know, I guess we'll see what he thinks of those other guys. I mean, if, if they really think that one of them can play or one of them has a chance to play, uh, they're not going to overspend. And I don't think he will anyway. I, I think, I think if it's a reasonable deal, he'll, he'll do it. If not, and there's really no reason to rush into anything. Uh, if somebody wants to sign him for like slay money, what's slay's average? Four, 14 a year. Um, I don't I have it in front of me. It's it's. I can look it up. Thirteen or fourteen. But you know, if somebody wants to pay him that, I, I'm not going to get into a bidding war for for James Bradbury. But if he wants to be here, you, you can do a reasonable offer. Uh, yeah, I would do it. I, I but I do think his number is going to go up, and you know he might want to wait. He might just want to wait. Maybe a corner gets hurt. Maybe a team realizes a draft pick isn't ready. Uh, you, you just never know. So um, Slay it, is. At sixteen point nine. Sixteen point nine. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, he's not going to get close to that. Um, but I could see him wanting. I mean, his old deal was, I think, fourteen million a year. So, uh, and change. So he might want. He might be looking for something in that ballpark. Uh, I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's a tough thing to figure out. But we both agree that you're looking at the secondary, the two holes to fill, cornerback and safety. You feel better with Marcus Epps penciled in as a starter at safety than you do Zach McPherson penciled in as a starter at corner. And that's not a knock on McPherson, but we just haven't seen him play. Whereas at least Epps, there's a small body of work. We've seen him play. He's been effective in a limited role. Can he be as effective in a bigger role? I, it, it looks like he's going to get that chance to show that. Uh, whereas the corner – I. If, if they can't sign James Bradbury, let me run through a, a list of some of the other free agents who are still out there. Because I look at these other names and I think, well, at this point, you might as well get to camp. And if these guys are unsigned, see what you have in the rookies. And if it looks like, all right, we, this isn't good enough, then you can go out and, and sign one of these guys or make a trade like they did for Ronald Darby back in 17 when they had a, a pretty clear need. But uh I'll go through some of the names. The most obvious one to me is Xavier Rhodes, uh, just because he has the familiarity with with Gannon. Uh, He's 31, so he's a little older, but he can be a starter. You know, he can come in on a short notice and start in the defense. So he'd be the guy who makes the most sense to me if if they – let's say they get to camp and they're looking at Zach McPherson and Tay Gowan and they go, all right, these guys aren't ready. Call Xavier, get him in here. Yeah, I, I'm always wary of those, you know, older corners just because when you lose like 5%, you're, you know, you just can't compete. And and everybody loses that at some point. It's just a matter of, you know, when it happens. Can you squeeze another year out of um, out of him? Probably. Um, I would just really need to be comfortable with, you know, his fitness, his health, um, you know, and, and his, his just how fast is he still? Is he Has he lost a step? I mean – the difference between an elite corner and an average corner or an average corner and a terrible corner is, is really, it's really not much, you know, that like the difference between a four, three, five and a four, four, five or something like that. So, um, I mean, other things go into it, but when you lose that step, so at 31, I'd be, I'd be careful. Uh, but if, you know, if, if he checks out physically health wise, uh, it, it's a good name. I always liked him. Yeah. And I think, you can feel some comfort and you're right. At a certain point, all these guys are going to not be effective players anymore, but he's been an effective player years removed from his peak. You know, he, cause he was an all pro, he was a pro bowl, all pro guy. And he hasn't been that the last couple of years, but he's still been a decent player. So I, I think there's at least some evidence that he could maybe do that again. Yeah. Um, and he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't cost you as much as as Bradbury. So yeah, it's a good name. 
Yeah, most of these guys on the list are over 30. The one who isn't is Kevin King, who's only 27, former second round pick, spent his whole career in Green Bay. He was back there last year on a one year deal. I, I don't even know if if he's a starter in the league. He's had some ups and downs in his career, but if you're thinking, hey, you want a younger guy who still has some potential, he might be that fit. Yeah, I don't know how many corners at that age, you know, take a step up. Um, I think of him as being okay. Um, honestly, I'd rather, I'd probably rather just go with one of the young guys than than a guy like him who's never really taken ownership as, of, of a starting position for, you know, and been that consistent player. Yeah, I'll, I'll just rattle off some names here, and you tell me if any of them interests you. Uh, and they're all over 30, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, Janoris Jenkins, Joe Hayden, Kyle Fuller, Richard Sherman, A.J. Boye, Jimmy Smith. Some of those guys are over 40, I think. <laughs> um, I mean, that's like the 2016 Pro Bowl team. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can't get excited about any of those guys. And that's what, what makes Bradbury so unusual. You don't really get that that kind of caliber player in his prime, in his 20s. What is he, 28, I believe? 28. Uh, yeah, th- those guys don't really come available. I'd argue he's no longer in his prime based on his play last year, but he's he's still young enough that you think, all right, maybe he can get back to that. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to really look look hard about the circumstances. I, I don't think he played that bad. I think he played better than you think, but um, certainly he wasn't as good as he had been. Um, but none of those guys, no. I, I, would, I would be wary of all of them, honestly. When you look at the cornerbacks on the roster, which ones do you think have the most legitimate shot to be a starter? It's so hard to say because like most of them weren't even here in training camp. I know. that, And maybe the Eagles really do want to see what these guys have in camp. Last year, McPherson was here in training camp, but he was a bright-eyed rookie last year. It's, it's a lot different if he comes back as a second-year player, kind of understanding – everything a little bit better and i thought he actually had some really good moments in training camp last year he did um i I mean i would put him at the top of the list just because he's a he's been in the defense for a year you know he's now he'll he'll have had two off seasons in the program he knows the defense Uh, i put him at the top of the list i I just really couldn't say out of the other guys i mean carrie vincent's my guy just because you took you took um ty gowan so Tay Gowan, Ty Detmer, Tay Detmer. Um, but and, and one thing to remember is that whoever the corners are, they're going to have a fighting chance, I would think, with the, the way the D-line and linebacker positions have been upgraded. Uh, they're going to get more pressure, I would think. They better, considering the moves they've made. Uh, I think that was a big problem with the secondary last year. There were they did not play well consistently, uh, but they I don't know how you play cornerback when there's no pressure being applied up front and when quarterbacks can just stand there and just wait for guys to come open. Mm-hmm. That's really not on the secondary as much as the D line, and they were terrible. I mean, the, yeah. the, the the edge rushers were all ineffective for large portions of the year or the entire year. So. Uh, I think that I think that'll help, but um, I, I, look, they've been saying all off season how much they believe in this whole group. So, you know, we'll see if it comes down to that. It's going to be it's going to be a free for all in training camp. It would really make for I mean one of the biggest storylines in camp, and it would be fun. It would. Uh, I, I don't know how much fun it'll be week one or week two when we see them on the field, but it'll be fun in training camp because. They're legitimate weapons at receiver, too. So it's like whoever, when they go ones versus ones in training camp, whoever is CB2 is going to have a tough matchup. You know, if you have, you're going to be lining up against Devontae Smith or A.J. Brown outside. Yeah, well, or or Rager if he wins that, you know, number two job. But um, it was a joke. Um, you know, all these guys do have some traits. I mean, they, they all can run or, you know, have a little bit of size. So, uh you know, I mean, certainly a guy. I mean, a guy like Mario Goodrich is pretty intriguing. I mean, he was a lot of people thought he was going to be a, a day two pick um, or early day three pick. So 
there, there's some interesting names. And, uh, you know, some of these guys were drafted, so they've, they've you know, teams believed them, believed in them at some point. So it's not like they're all just undrafted rookies who've never played uh, or have never shown that they can play. So most of them went to big schools. Uh, it, it'll be fun. I kind of hope it comes down to that because I want to see these guys and, and see what they bring. Yeah. And I, I, the guy who you mentioned a little bit earlier, Josiah Scott, he's probably not really in the running to be right. the the top outside corner, but they do like him and they like him as a nickel. So I, I had an idea last week and Uh-oh. I wanted to get your take on it. What if in certain packages – Josiah Scott becomes the first guy off the bench and they're able to then, because we look at the safeties and we're like, Oh man, the safety depth isn't great. You want to put Avante at safety in big nickel situations. Yeah. Because I, I, I think the drop off from safety to nickel corner. I, I look at the Josiah Scott. They like a lot. He can play that nickel spot. And then you can do a lot of same things, really, with Avante, but kind of drop him as a safety a little bit more. Yeah, in theory, but Josiah Scott's got to do it. And, I mean, he's got to play at a pretty high level. Um, I don't know if he can do it. I mean, I, I like that idea, and I think you probably should write it You know, one of these days. I think you will. You probably already did. Uh, but I haven't. But I, it, I just think it's fascinating it because, like, the next guy off the bench at safety would be Kayvon Wallace, who I, I like, but I think he is probably a little bit more limited. Uh, he's not as rangy as he'd probably ideally like to have when he's the third safety. So if you can have Avante, who can pretty much do anything, and he is rangy, he has a speed, and then you can bring Josiah Scott off the bench, and I think Josiah Scott's probably going to be on the team as the backup nickel and a special team where he became a primary gunner toward the end of the season last year. I wonder, and, and I think Gannon is going to really mix and match a lot of his personnel at training camp to the point yeah. where we're not going to have any idea what the heck they're actually going to do. Do you have any concerns with Avante playing too much? And he's not the biggest guy plays, you know, plays hard. I, I, I love his game. Um, but do you have any concerns about him playing too many reps? No. No, I'd, I'd play him. I, uh, Yeah, it, for whatever reason, he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who's going to wear down. And if he does, y- y- you live with that. He, he doesn't cost a whole ton. He, he's making a good salary now, but it's not like he's super top of the line. And he's played a lot. Like, it's not like he's worn down at all yet. He's, he's kind of been a part-time player because he's a nickel, but – Nichols in the NFL now plays 75% anyway. He's played every position in the secondary. I, I wouldn't worry about that. I'd play him. And because he's so versatile, I would never take him off the field. I would take everybody off the field at some point, but almost everybody. But uh, it, it's an interesting theory. I, I like it, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if they – if they try it out, it's going to depend on Josiah Scott. I mean, I know they're high on him, but how many guys have they been high on who just didn't pan out? So got to see him in action, see what he's all about. Uh, it's certainly I, I've always liked the idea of Avante getting some work at safety. And, you know, as long as he's not at outside corner, I think, you, you know, you could be on to something. I've been trying for years to get Avante back at safety, haven't I? You have since before I the see, podcast. I see Bob Sanders. Just an undersized safety who's super rangy but tough can play pretty much anywhere but he is so good at the net and that's what makes him so good as a nickel corner like we saw last year so it's, it, those traits are pretty transferable i think he really had a good year last year avante i, I just he thought did. he was so consistently good he's always in the right place he's physical uh, he can tackle he's knocking balls down um you know he's 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 smart he's instinctive uh he, he was very good last year He's about the best tackler you're, you'll see at like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, it's true. Yeah, he really – that's why I, I get a little worried about him getting hurt just because he's just a smaller guy, but he plays – you know, he plays like a guy who's six feet, six one. Yeah, which is – I mean, he does that so well that the Eagles foolishly thought they could play him outside, and his his ability would make up for the lack of length, and 
Yeah, didn't didn't go well. Uh, that was the problem when he played outside. Was I mean, he was in the right place, but he just ball was over his head. Yeah, it was it was a shame for him because that he that you know how coaches always spew that we want to put our players in a position to make plays. They didn't do that that year with him, and it was unfair. And he was the kind of guy who would never complain about it. But I'm glad he got his contract year. Well, not really a contract year. He got his extension based off a year of playing where he should have been playing the whole time. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go through um, some of these rookies and how much we think they'll play this upcoming season. So I have the list in front of me. This is a piece I, I've been working on. It's going to go up on the site on Wednesday morning. But I wanted to get your take on some of my takeaways from it. Jordan Davis. And we'll start with him. We'll go in uh, order here where they were picked. First round pick, and last year was so easy with the first round pick. It was Devontae Smith, and he said, well, <laughs> he's clearly going to start, and he's going to play a ton, and you don't really have to think about it. The Jordan Davis one is trickier because not only are there two defensive tackles who are incumbent starters ahead of him, but they have two defensive tackles who are making a lot of money, and it's too much money to just push them aside. So he's the third guy in this rotation. Yeah, uh, and I think it works out well because, you know, he's got a lot of work to do as far as getting in shape and just getting in football shape, getting in NFL shape. I, I'm guessing he won't be ready for a, a heavier workload this year anyway. And meanwhile, Fletcher and and Hargrave both played around, I think it was 65% of the snaps last year. I think for Fletcher that should come down a little. So I think it'll work out. I think, you know, I think Davis plays maybe 35% of the snaps. Uh, and Milton Williams plays about the same, and, and the starters play between 60 and 65. I think Hargrave can probably handle a few more than Fletch. He might be at 65. Fletch might be 55 to to, to 60, you know, depending on the game, the situation, the opponent. But um, I think it might help Fletch because I, I think he'll, you know, at, at his at where he is as a player now. I just don't think you want him out there for, you know, for 80 percent of the snaps. And when he plays too much, you, you see it catch up to him. So I think it all kind of might work out. And um, I mean, he was, again, it was even playing Ridgeway, you know, 20 snaps a game last year. So he didn't really give you anything. So uh, I like the idea of Davis kind of working in, being a situational guy. And, and you know, I think you'll see Milton in and out, inside and outside. And, uh, but yeah, I think he'll play a lot, but, you know, people might complain, well, he's a first-round pick. Why isn't he playing more? I think eventually he will. He better, as a 13th pick in the draft, play more than 35 snaps in year two. But for this year, you know, I think it works out that they can get him in shape, get him used to the game, get a lot out of him without playing him too much, where he tends to wear down and, you know, get him down to 330, whatever the good playing weight is from 345, and, you know, and then give Fletcher the time that he needs to, to rest. Yeah, so uh, let me throw some numbers at you because uh, everyone knows he went from like 31 snaps uh, in the 2020 season to about 25 snaps per game last year at Georgia where they did rotate him. So if he plays 25 snaps per game this year, that will put him at around 425 snaps. And based on last year's totals, that would be about 38%. Um, I think he can play more than that. I don't know if it'll be a lot more than that, but last year you look at Milton Williams, he ended up playing 40%, but some of that was inside outside. But I think the Eagles are going to be multiple enough up front that Jordan Davis can play 30 snaps a game. I think well, that's we're the same ballpark. Uh, I, I think a lot yeah. of it's going to depend on his fitness. If you know, the last thing you need is a, a defensive tackle wearing down in the fourth quarter. So um, I, I think they're going to have to be careful with it. 30 snaps is still less than half. Um, and in, in most games, and almost every game, it'll be less than mm -hmm. half. Um, I, I think that's a good number. I think it's going to be in that 25 to 30 uh, range. Yeah. So I look back at Fletcher's rookie season uh, back in 2012. Want to guess a percentage of how much he played that year? I hate guessing. Just tell me. 52%. Interesting. You Who hate are the guessing tackles because in you, hate, you, hate, you hate fun. <laughs> Who were the D tackles in 2012? 2012? I just really, I hate guessing. I hate when people text me, they're like, hey, guess what I did today? I just tell me if it's that important to you. Like, you know, because the rest of us like to have know. fun. 
I'm not going to just start here and start guessing names. Oh, you ran into Bob. Oh, no, you ran into Joe. Maybe you ran into Bill. Who cares? Just tell me who you freaking ran into, Dave. Yeah. When you watch Jeopardy at night, you go, why don't you just tell me what the answer is? Why are you making a game out of this? Yeah, because that's exactly the same. Well, guessing a percentage isn't the same as guessing Bob, Bill, or Joe either. Just tell me how many. Who, who were the other D tackles in 2012? Uh, I'm guessing it would be, who was it, Mike Patterson <laughs> would have been in 2012. Yeah, he was still here. Antonio yeah. Dixon, maybe? Maybe. C2012? I believe Antonio Dixon is the largest player the Eagles have ever had. Is that right? It was like listed at like 365. Well, my lot is at the time, yeah. And my lot is yeah. bigger, yeah. But even anyway, though my lot is not listed that big, but he's 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 he is, uh, he's they listed yeah. at like 346. He's like 500. Nah, he's like 611, 500. He's more than that. It's funny how, like, you see Milata in the locker room back when we were allowed in the locker room, and like you would see him next to like a guy that you think of as big, like another offensive lineman, like he's he's standing there next to you know Lane, and he just towers over him. And Lane's a Lane's a big dude. He's just like he's looking down at Lane. Hey, hey there. Anyway, fifty-two um, percent. That's interesting. Um, I mean, he was. He was ahead of where – I mean, obviously, in 2012, they needed him more than they need Jordan Davis right now. So they have the luxury of not playing him that much. Yeah. All right, let's go to the second round, and this is as tough as the first round is. second round is even tougher because it's Cam Jurgens. I was Jurgens. just going to say, it's interesting. Fletcher might be right back at that 52% this year. He might go out the same way he came in. All, unless the Eagles are saying this is your last year here, we might as well use you up. Yeah. But they, I mean, they have some depth there now, so I don't think they'll have to. Yeah. Cam Jurgens. It's it's a tough thing to figure out because, in a lot of ways, if this goes to plan, he's not going to play that much. Yeah, and you know, the, the, he is going to cross train at guard. So kind of like uh, Landon Dickerson last year. If you asked me this a year ago, I'd have said, "Oh, he, he's not going to play." Obviously, started most of the season after both starting guards got hurt. Um, Kelsey, you know, I'm not going to jinx Kelsey, but um, I think if I think if if Cam Jurgens plays, it's going to be a, a spot start here or there at guard. I, I'll say I'll say he starts three games at guard this year. Is that your guess? And then one at center the last day of the season after the Eagles clinch number one seed. <laughs> number one seed, look at you. Uh yeah, it's it's a it's the so the difference between Dickerson and Jurgens is and and I know they're cross training, but and even Sirianni admitted Landon's more of a, a guard who can play center, whereas they think Jurgens is more of a center who can play guard. Right. And just the numbers tell you, well, there's two guards and there's only one center. And Dickerson last year was backing up, we thought. Isaac Samalu and Brandon Brooks, who both had injury histories, and sure enough, both got hurt. So then he ended up starting at right guard briefly and then moved over to left guard for the rest of the season. So, um, yeah, I don't want to jinx Kelsey either, but he's been a very durable player. And it's, you know, it's what are the chances? I, you never say never. It's a violent game. He's a, an older player. Sure, something could happen. And, Jurgens would play then, but uh, it's harder to find that route for Jurgens this year than it is for Landon last year. Yeah, no question about it. If the Eagles played a two center front, you know, maybe, but um, yeah, you're going from two injury prone guards to one center that hasn't missed a game in like nine years. So um, that's true. Uh, but, you know, guys end up at some somewhere, somewhere along the line, he's going to play. Uh, I don't think it'll be a, you know, total redshirt year. I think at some point, even if it's at the end of a game. Yeah. And he'll um, dress, I, I would imagine. He, he'll dress and he'll play some on special teams. And if yeah. Kelsey has to come out for a few series, he's going to be the next guy in. Or if they're down 30 nothing, if they're up 30 nothing, which which is more likely. But Well, if uh, they got the one seed, probably up. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um you know, it would be fun to see him. He'll be fun to watch in camp, certainly. But, um, 
yeah, I think uh, I think you'll save a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, and it's for me, him at guard's a tough sell. It is, I, I know, agree. And I, I yeah, absolutely, they have to cross train him because you can't just be a backup center, no matter who you are. Even if you're a second round pick, ready to replace Jason Kelsey, you, you need to have a little bit more versatility than that if you're a backup. So they're going to cross train him. He's if you're looking for a compare, like he's not that much smaller than Isaac Samalu was when he came in the league in 2016. But we also back then thought Samalu was going to be a, a center and he ended up having to get bigger and stronger to play guard. Yeah. He is undersized. Jurgens is undersized to play guard. And the fact that Herbie's not here anymore um, might factor into it, but they still have, they still have depth at guard. So I think it's, I, I'm just saying three games just because generally guys play more than we expect them to. Yeah, and bleep happens. So uh, bleep does happen. Hey, third round. Pick. Guess yeah. whether bleep happens. It does. You're right. See, I enjoyed that. That was a fun game for me. It was fun. I might be. Yeah. I might be coming around here. Third round pick, Nicobe Dean. Who? It's funny. When's the last time everyone was this excited about a third round pick? Not even Nick Foles. It's <laughs> yeah. a good question. Uh, it's yeah, not it's often you get a, a first round caliber guy who was the one of the best defensive players on the best defense in college football in the third round. So what was Westbrook? Was he a two or a three? He was a three, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. People were really excited about him. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But, but that I mean, was also a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. It's, it is exciting and it'll be fun to see Nicobe Dean on the field. As long as he's healthy, You'll probably agree here. I think he's going to play an awful lot. I do too. I do too. And um, I'm guessing he'll play the most out of all the linebackers when it comes to snap count. Uh, I would think. Now we'll see how they how they line up with uh, Kazir White and uh, T.J. Edwards. I think will play a lot fewer snaps, which I, I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's good for him. I, I still think he has some things he does well, and I want him in the mix. I want him on the team. He's a good special teamer. Uh, but I think I think Nico, Nicobe Dean is going to play an awful lot, and I think he's going to be really good. I do too, and I I mean, you look at it, he'd be I'd, I'd have him start at the mic, which is a lot. It's a yeah. lot for a rookie. But uh, you know, I went back and uh, went through the transcript of his combine interview, and one of the last questions was about getting a green dot as a rookie and he said yeah i want that i want that green dot which is on the helmet and it's it's an indicator that he has the radio communication with the coaches it's it's it takes a lot for a rookie linebacker to just be out there and be the signal caller and and how it's a huge responsibility but i think he'd be up for it and if if he looks like that guy in training camp you can't let Kaiser White or TJ Edwards keep this kid off the field. Yeah, I would agree. And I I think he's you can tell just talking to him for a few minutes how you know how thoughtful he is, how intelligent he is. Um I, I think he's got and I think it's important we, we can't look at him like a third round pick. You know, he's really he's a third round pick who should have been picked in the first round, the second round at the latest. And I think their expectations of him will be the same as if he was a one. I really do. I mean it Three weeks ago, people a month ago, people thought he was going to be a first round pick. So, uh, you know, then he started. You know, then then there was word he might be dropping and second round pick. But um, man, when was the last time a rookie linebacker started for this team? A good one. It's been a long time. Yeah, I think he will though, and uh, we'll see. But of all the draft picks, I think people are most excited to see him. Yeah, people seem really excited about uh, Jordan Davis, but I, I think you're right about Dean. Just because it was just the way it went down, it was such a surprise, and it was so unexpected, especially after they passed on him and um, you know in the second round and, and took um, took Cam Jurgens. Nobody ever dreamed that he would still be there at, at 101. I mean, was it 101? 83. I'm sorry, yeah. at 83. Um, and it's 32 picks after they thought about taking him at 51. So. Um, yeah, it's – and, you know, he's got a great personality. Um, he's he's so confident 
Uh, you know, if if any if any rookie can handle what they're about to throw at him, I, I think he can. Um, just because he thinks like a first round pick, he plays like a first round pick. We think, um, and he acts like a first round pick. He carries himself like a first round pick, and he's trying to prove to everyone that he should have been a first round pick. Yeah, I think the confidence is a big part of it. If you're not confident as someone getting thrown into that type of situation, you're probably going to fail. Uh, That's so true. And- and he has that. At least he, even if he doesn't have it, he acts like he has it. And sometimes that's just as good, or at least it can cover it up a little bit. So, I, well, I think you think that, about the, you know, the rookies last year. I mean, Devonte and um, uh, Dickerson, they they both did that. I mean, they both mm-hmm. they did not care. I mean, they, they come from a program that you're almost not even a rookie when you get to the NFL because they played at such a high level, and it's a program where they. You know, they they treat the players, they treat the whole program like a, a, a professional operation. So um, neither of those guys with the moment was never too big for them. They, they had that confidence that they could come right in. They were the first – it was the first time two Eagles offensive rookies have been full-time starters in the same season since 1973. Wow. Jerry Sizemore and, uh, and um, Charlie Johnson, I believe it was. But um, – it's rare. I mean, starters don't play. I mean, the last the last Eagles starter to start 16 games in a season before Devontae was Barrett Brooks. As a you know, whatever happened to him anyway? I don't know. <laughs> he kind of disappeared, but um <laughs> it's it is rare. There's just so much to process, so much to learn. And like you said, the confidence is a huge part of it. And to have all those things working for you and the talent, uh, it, it's a lot to ask. All right, two six round picks, which you know, once you get to the sixth round, nothing is is a given, and these guys will have to make the team. But uh, Kyron Johnson or Kieron Johnson, as uh, there, you know, what's funny after his press conference the other day, we asked him how do you pronounce your name, and he said Kieron. Then I went back and listened, and during his press conference, he said when he thinks special teams, I want you to think Kyron Johnson. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm still not completely sure how to say his name because he said it differently within the span of 10 minutes. So uh, I'll maybe, go Kieran because that's what he said when we asked him specifically. Maybe he was um, talking about Kieran Pratt. <laughs> oh, I forgot about him. Palmyra kid. Yeah. So the last Eagle um, linebacker to start more than five games as a rookie was Kendricks in 2012. And before that, Brian Roll in 2011. He, he wasn't very good, but they just didn't have any. Before that, you got to go to Gokong. Ray Farmer in 96. Um, and that's it over the last uh, 50 years. How many did Kendricks? Who well, who started the most of that group? Uh, Kendrick started 14. I think he got banged up. I think he missed a couple with an injury, but he, he played pretty well as a rookie. 14. So, Nicobe Dean has the added benefit of an extra game. Do you think he can start 14 plus? <sighs> Oh, it's so hard to say. I'm going to guess no. I'm going to guess no. It is Just, tough. Is that an injury thing, or is that a he might not be a starter in name? Like they might not have him yeah. out there for the first snap. That's what I'm thinking. Because, you know, with with the way Gannon coaches, you never know who's going to be out there. I mean, if if the other team comes out in four wides, maybe he's not out there to start the game. Who knows? Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to take the under. But I think he'll play an awful lot. Okay. All right, six-round picks. We started there. Uh, with Kieran Johnson, uh, the linebacker from Kansas, was the defensive end at Kansas, 6'1", 235 defensive end. So he's really going to be that Sam linebacker position here with the Eagles. He has to make the team. I, I think it'll be two Johnsons battling it out in training camp, Kieran Johnson and Patrick Johnson for that backup Sam spot. Yeah, and it's going to come down to special teams probably more than anything. I think Kieran Johnson is – I mean, he – he talks about it like he loves doing it. Um, everybody does. Everybody has to do it. But um, I think mean, he's got the build for it. He's got uh, he's got the athleticism for it. I think that's where he's going to make the team or not make the team. For any late round guy, you know your your odds of making the team as a position player are not great. So uh, it's going to come down to special teams. I, I think he's going to be a pretty good special teamer. Yeah, he seems. I mean, Patrick Johnson last year played a lot. Uh, what was it, 254 special team snaps last year, fourth on the roster. So that's 
where he carved out his role. But you remember early in the year last year, they tried to play Patrick Johnson on defense. Really, for the first three weeks, he was he was even getting more snaps than Jannard Avery. And then they flipped it, and Avery pretty much got every snap at that Sam spot the rest of the way. And whoever is the backup Sam linebacker, they're not going to start taking a bunch of snaps away from Hassan Reddick. Right, right. So I think you go into it just – I mean, it's going to – look, if one of them is significantly better than the other one defensively, that'll help. But I think it's going to come down to special teams. I don't remember Patrick Johnson – one way or the other on special teams, he certainly didn't. He didn't flash to me as far as what a what a playmaker on special teams, but um, he, it, it didn't go the other way either. I'm surprised to hear he played that many reps. Yeah, it was a lot. All right, the last six round pick, uh, Grant Calcaterra from SMU and Oklahoma. I think he's going to make the team just because. Who else is going to make the team? They have Dallas Goddard, and they have Jack Stoll. And that's really it at the tight end position. They had, you know, Tyree Jackson, who's coming back from an ACL, probably not going to be ready. They'll keep him around, I'm sure, yeah. on the pop list. Jay Jaw in that experiment, who knows? You know, I think that's an uphill battle for him. I don't want, I'll spare us the, the Jay Jaw jokes here and just say I think it's a, a long shot. They have Noah Tagoa, who, I mean, we both put him in the Hall of Fame of the Eagle Eye Hall of Fame, but actually making this team. Probably not. Richard Rogers, you cut him and he's a phone call away. Who else is in the Eagle Eye Hall of Fame? Or is it just Noah to go? It's just Noah to go. He's the only inductee so far. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I think um Jack Stoll, man, he played so many snaps last year for you. You kind of didn't notice him because he didn't catch the ball, but uh he was playing 35 snaps a game. He didn't play much early, but after the Ertz trade. Played a lot. I think he's going to be – I think TE2 is going to be either Calcaterra or Stoll, depending on, you know, how the game is evolving, what they're trying to do offensively. Um, he can catch the ball. Uh, you know, the concussions are a concern. He seems to think uh, – he made a good point. They're three years ago. I haven't had one because he took the year off. He, he got hurt in the middle. I guess it was middle of 19. Mm-hmm. And then he he didn't play in 20. And then he was – He was only all- teammates with Jalen Hurts for like five games. For five games, yeah. He, so he played half of 19, um, retired, and um, was studying with Fireman Danny out in California to be to, – but and then, you know, he came back last year and he played the whole year and was healthy. So it's been since um, – really since late October, early November since he's had one. So it, it's probably not a huge concern, but it is a concern because anybody who's had multiple concussions – you just got to keep an eye on, but he can catch the ball. And, uh, you know, if he can do that, he has a chance to be like TE2 slash TE3. And, you know, depending on the situation, I think Stoll's going to give you a lot more on the line of scrimmage. I know he is. And then Calcaterra can, can be that receiving guy. You know, he's just got to catch the ball consistently to, you know, to do it. I mean, Richard Rogers is always a phone call away. We know he's a really good receiver. So, uh, I'm sure they hope that he can he can be that second receiving tight end. Um, I mean, the, the numbers when when uh, when Stahl played like over 15 snaps last year, the Eagles were seven and two and averaged 28 points a game. When he didn't play or played a handful of snaps, they were whatever the difference is, uh, two and um, seven. No, they played 18 games. Yeah, that's right. Include the playoffs. Um, and, and the average twenty, you know, twenty-two points. And I'm not I sure. Think it's all there, him. there might be a faulty causation metric there. But I know I, I'm not saying he's the only reason for that. But I'm just saying he can be a, fa- a really good blocker. He's a really good blocker. Um, there's a reason he was playing so much. There's some games he played over forty snaps when they were running the ball all the time. So um, I think he'll play a lot. But I, I do think Alcatara has a shot. I, I would say I'm going to say fifteen to twenty snaps a game. Yeah, that's fair. I, You look at it, and I don't even know if it's going to be really clearly defined tight end two, tight end three, because they're right. so different. That's what I think they'll, they'll both be on the roster. But you also can't tip it. Like they, they both have to improve in their deficient areas because you can't send one of them out there and tip what the play is. You know, you have to have right. – they, they each have to kind of make up 
ground where they're a little deficient. And I, I think there are different types of players too. Like Kakatera is, they see him as that F type of tight end who's really going to be a receiver and have matchup or cause matchup problems for defenses as a receiver. So I think there's room for both of those guys to be on the roster and get some snaps. We saw Stahl catch the ball pretty well in camp. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surprised how, how well he did. Um, caught almost everything. So I think he's got some ability to catch the ball. He's just never really asked. Would he catch three or four passes all year? Four. Um, so I don't remember a lot of drops, uh, but um, he doesn't have to catch 40 or 50 balls. He just has to be a guy that defenses have to keep in mind he can catch the football and get you seven yards on third and five. It's early, but I think all five draft picks will be on the team and playing this year. I, I think there's a good chance of that. And it helps that there's not 10 of them because then your odds are, I mean, they kept, what, nine out of 10 last year at some point were on the team, I think. Um, actually, actually, they were all on the roster at some point, I believe, all 10 of them. But yeah, well, I, I would agree with that. Was I think Jacoby Stevens was a. I think elevation. he played in the last game. He might have been a, a practice squad call up, I guess, probably. Yeah. But uh, he did play. They all got on the field. I'll say that, put it that way. And that's unusual, especially when you have that many. Uh, but I'll tell you what, and I did this piece. Uh, it's on our site. I, I think it was posted Monday or Tuesday on the top 10 Eagles under 25 as of opening day. And I compared it to the same story I did two years ago. And I mean, the difference is really, really striking how much more young talent there is. Now, a lot of these guys are projections. A lot of these guys are guesswork. Uh, but it sure seems like Howie's done a really good job over the last two off seasons of finally stocking the roster with young players, and it's something they had to do. Yeah, absolutely. It's it is amazing. You and I were going through the lists, and then we found the one from two years ago. And, oh my god, who was on that list two years ago? Anthony, Anthony Rush. Rush was on that list. When's Jay the last John. time you even thought about Anthony Rush? I was like, I didn't have anyone to put on there. Jay Jaw was was number ten. Derek Barnett was number two. I mean, now he if, if he was 24, he wouldn't even be on the list. He'd probably be like number 9 or 10. Um, yeah, who else was I mean, Miles was number one. Now, anybody who – some of these guys like A.J. Brown isn't even on the list because he turns 25 in June. And, and I model it after an SI thing that they did a couple of years ago. So I want to keep the same guidelines. A.J. Brown's 24. And he's not even on the list because he'll be 25 on opening day. I love how many responses you got just – what about AJ Brown? What about AJ Brown? What about AJ Brown? I finally just took a sc- I just kind of got the paragraph where I explained it and, and tweeted it to everyone. <laughs> They're complaining about it. They must have gotten into the story, but just kind of looked through the names. But, but yeah. you know, and, and guys like I mean, there's a, a lot of other I mean, Malata's 25, Sweat's 25. So it's not just those 10. I mean, there's a lot of young talent in this team, more than more than there has been in a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of, of young guys, Tom Brady, who uh, is back for the 2022 season, news breaks on Tuesday that whenever he does hang him up for real, like actually for real and not for a month, he's going into the broadcast booth with Fox on a 10-year, <laughs> $375 million contract. His next job is going to be more lucrative than being the best football player in the world. <laughs> Ever. Um, so 10 years. So you figure he'll retire after like the 2031 season. So it'll run through 2040. I mean, Fox is looking at this like a steal because with inflation they're I mean, they're going to get a pretty good deal out of this in 10 years when, when he finally retires. It's the first contract Tom Brady's ever gotten that, that like he didn't have to worry about the cap. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, I think he'll be pretty good. You know, he's, uh, it's interesting because a lot of these guys, like the longer they're away from the game, they don't know the coaches, they don't know the players, you know, so they're really insightful the first couple of years. And then they're like, I think back to Roma, who I think is still very good, but those first couple of years, it was magic because was he was just, he was just scouting these teams. He was yeah. playing against them. So I, I think you're right. That was, the, that's who I was thinking of too. He's not, yeah. he's not the same anymore. He can't do that. Yeah. Because he's not, I mean, he's not going to do that. He's not going to scout like he's still playing. But Troy Aikman, to me, has maintained I – mean, he didn't really start until, I think, a while after he played. But um, to me, he's – he, and we're talking about two Cowboys quarterbacks, so, I, you know. But um, he's the gold standard to me, to borrow Jeffrey's phrase, because 
he's never had that drop off. He just does so much homework and he's always prepared. Yeah. I'm 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 curious to see how Brady does because he does have a personality as much as people in this town won't want to admit that. He is kind of a fun guy at times. He'll joke around. I'm curious to see what persona he'll take on TV. It's kind of interesting that like how many how many national football analysts are like guys that Phillies uh, Eagles fans hate. I mean, it's Romo true. Aikman and Brady are like three of the most despised like And they hate people. Buck more. <laughs> What's that? And they hate Buck more. That's true. Everyone does. Yeah. Uh it so the funny thing to me is he was in New England for so long and he never got a chance to show his personality. I don't know if he gets this deal if he doesn't go to Tampa Bay. You don't know if he if he gets this big broadcasting deal if he doesn't go to Tampa Bay. You mean if and, he got it after his last year in New England? Yeah, I don't think he would get the same type of deal. I don't think because he hadn't gotten a chance to really show his personality much. I think he would have gotten a big a big deal, but maybe yeah, maybe you're right. I think he's and that's like a it's like a Belichick thing, you know. You're not allowed to yeah. have a personality, um, kind of like an Alabama thing, you know. It takes those guys a couple of years to 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 show it when they get to the NFL. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's probably true. I think it'll be really good. I just have a hunch. Yeah, I think he probably will be too, and he better be because he's going to get paid thirty seven million dollars a year. But you know, it's interesting. That's like I think that's like what Tobias Harris gets, by the way. Number thirty-six million. Um, you can have a quarterback like complete, like you know, thirty-one out of thirty-five passes, three touchdowns, no interceptions, throw for four hundred eleven yards. He'll be like criticizing the guy because, like, well, he's not as good as me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it, 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 sometimes it is a tough thing, though the the criticism part of it. Yeah, for ex players, especially if they like, what if he's got to call a Patriots game? Well, then you have to criticize your friends. It's, it's hard to do that sometimes. Yeah, even though by the time he retires, none of the Patriots will still be there. Well, I mean, t- he'll know guys. I mean, most he'll, of the players, he'll know guys in the league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, which Eagles do you think would be good broadcasters? I mean, I, obviously, we're both going to say Kelsey. He's a no-brainer. That goes without saying. Um, is a former Eagle who I always thought would be really good. Is Jordan Hicks. I always thought he was. Oh, yeah. He's got a great delivery, a great voice, uh, insightful. He, he speaks clearly. Um, he's he's always been a guy I thought could could do it. Uh, another former Jordan. Jordan um, Jordan Matthews would be good, too. Yeah, he would. But he'd be still recapping the first play, like in the third quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. All right, how about current Eagles, though, aside from Kelsey? Because he's he is the obvious one. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, you know who actually I, I thought of, and he hasn't really played much. Well, he plays enough. Uh, Boston Scott would be good. I think Boston Scott would be, um, you know, he's funny, he's thoughtful, he's got a good voice, uh, he knows the game. He's he, he just came to mind. I like that. I'll, I'd put Slay in the booth just just for pure comedy purposes. Yeah. I think he'd be more of a pregame, postgame type of guy. He'd be good at that. Well, he could be really a rare, a, a reverent, and you know, kind of like Barkley and those guys and Shaq in, in the booth, you know, just ripping on everyone and having fun. I think that would, I think Slay would be great. Put Slay and Asante in the same booth, and it was just oh, all hell break loose. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'm trying any, to think any around players. Any other current players? Um, I'm going like up and down the locker room that we're not allowed into anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little tough. I don't know. I, I think those are the ones that that come to mind. I mean, I think Jordan Mailata has the personality to do it. Uh, and, and in the slave vein, I, I think uh, Brandon Graham would be much better on a pre-post game show than he would be doing like color commentary. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like yeah. really let him loose and let him have some fun. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's all. Got anything else before we wrap this up? No, we should. You want to mention? Uh... Yeah, I was going to do that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say his name because I wasn't sure if you wanted to, like. Yeah. 
anyway. Yeah. What do you got? Uh, well, we just wanted to congratulate our, our good buddy Ray Dinger. Announced his retirement uh, after 53 years. Is that right? 53 years covering football, and uh, we appreciate all the times he's come on the show. We're gonna try to get him on the Eagle Eye podcast one more time before he uh, he hangs up his notepad. Uh, but it's uh, it's I mean that is I don't know if there's anyone more universally respected than than him. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably true. Um, and, and just beloved. I mean, he's you know he's never has a bad word to say to anyone. He's he's a great storyteller. His memory's incredible. Um, you know, I did this book uh, called "The Fifty Greatest Plays in Eagles History," and I asked him to proofread it. And like he didn't, he didn't even need to look anything up. He'd be like, you know, that touchdown was actually in the third quarter, not the fourth <laughs> quarter. I mean, he's just like he knew it was from like 1955. Uh, he was so helpful with that. And you know, I've got I've gotten to do radio with him for 20 years on WIP, and you know, we've had him on the podcast. We've done TV with him. Um, we did quick slants with him. You know, so it's been had some really memorable radio shows with him. I, I, maybe we'll, we'll mention a couple of them when we talk to him, but. Um, he's been an icon in this city and, uh, I'm, I'm just happy that he's going to have a chance to, cause he works so hard and he just, you know, he's, he's, uh, going to have a chance to do some things for himself now and spend some time with his wife and travel and do what he wants. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited for him. Yeah. He won't have me bugging him for predictions every week. <laughs> you can, so I have a good one for you. I just last year, I, cause I, I collect our predictions every week little how the sausage is made there. I collect our predictions for the site. And uh, it was a rare time where he hadn't gotten back to me. So uh, I call him and his his wife, Maria, answers the phone. I say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for Ray. And she said, OK, I'll have him call you back. And he calls me back not long after that. And come to find out his wife is the sweetest lady. Come to find out that was her cell phone. And one time several years ago he called me back from her cell phone and i saved the number and i had it in there as just right i thought it was the house phone that i've been calling <laughs> all these years and his wife was so sweet that she never mentioned it to me so <laughs> I, I i owe her you know a, a bouquet of flowers or a present or something for all the times i just called her phone thinking it was the house line uh, i did a radio show with ray a few years ago and i actually got him to agree to start a Twitter account. And he said, as long as you set it up, you know, and you create the password in the account, I'll, I'll do it. And actually I did that. And then he never, you know, I gave him like the, the logon info and how to sign in. He's like, yeah, I don't know. I just don't think I'm <laughs> so like, for, for about a week. I really thought it was going to happen. So technically he had a Twitter. He never tweeted, but he had it. Nobody ever knew about it. There was never any activity on the account. But I guess he did technically have a Twitter. Do you think it still exists? I I, I wouldn't even know how to sign in, but probably not. <laughs> okay. I don't have to sign in my own. <laughs> <laughs> we will work on getting him here one more time before he officially retires. But we wish him all the best. And if you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. We appreciate the five-star reviews. They actually do help us. If you're watching on YouTube, also uh, please subscribe there. Click the like button. That's it. We'll be back with you late Thursday night after the schedule. We'll break all, all that down. And uh, everyone have a good week. We'll talk to you soon.